On my very first day as mayor of Whistler, I did something that created chaos and controversy and put Whistler on the map in a way I'd never expected to. It's loud in the middle of the storm. For me, some simple sage advice from a friend was my guide through it all. November 7th, 2018 was my first day on the job. I'd served on council for a while, so I knew the people, I knew the place. I'm sure every mayor of every town says it, but I get to work with an exceptional group of people. So that day, I walked into the office with a little nervousness, but with lots of anticipation. The job of mayor includes all kinds of different responsibilities, but one thing is for sure, mayors sign letters. On that first day, there was a pile of letters on the edge of the desk ready for my signature, each addressed to one of the top 20 oil and gas companies on the planet. Letters asked these companies to join governments in paying for the cost of climate change. I knew about this letter a couple months earlier when I was a councillor, our council had agreed to join municipalities across Canada in a letter writing campaign. I really didn't see anything wrong with the letter. Municipalities write letters to all kinds of people about all kinds of things. And climate action is important. It's important to me and it's important to our community. These letters were addressed to multinational companies from around the world. But it struck us then that there were no letters addressed to Canadian companies. We decided it was important to include at least one Canadian company. So we prepared a 21st letter to a Canadian company. I signed them all and we posted them. A month later, many Canadian newspapers across our country ran some variation of the headline, Whistler wants to bill Alberta oil and gas company for climate change expenses. And all hell broke loose. Overnight, my inbox went from 10 emails to thousands. The news across Canada was profiling me and the oil and gas sector was organizing a boycott of Whistler. Thousands of emails. Some were really nasty threatening me personally or even naming my kids. Most were incredibly thoughtful and interesting. They talked about Canada. They talked about pipelines. They talked about how important it is for the oil and gas sector to be at the heart of our climate effort. They came from school teachers. They came from pipe fitters, executives in large corporations, and heads, uh, former heads of provincial governments. I start to notice a theme in those letters, whether nasty or interesting. And it was that tourism has our own guilt with which to struggle. Skis are made of petroleum products and tourism depends on travel by plane. I love my town. I love being involved in the tourism industry. I'm convinced that Whistler is home to the best skiing, hiking, biking, hotels and restaurants in the whole world. I love welcoming people here to experience it all. That said, these letter writers made a very fair point. Every industry has its own impact and tourism is no small actor. For some, the fact that tourism shares responsibility for our climate situation means we have no right to participate in the climate discussion. Our voices must fall silent. Hypocrites cannot speak. I was surprised by my response to that argument. I can tell you with a degree of certainty, the cliche of the fiery redhead exists for a reason. I am not shy. And yet, I felt a growing willingness to be silenced. Threats, fear, and my own hypocrisy exposed brushed me back like a fastball, high and inside. Learned helplessness is a behavioral theory articulated by psychologist Martin Seligman. 
He used research involving shocks on dogs and then loud noises on humans to demonstrate that the application of persistent pain teaches animals they cannot change their situation. Like the baby elephant who is secured to a small stake as a newborn, learns it cannot pull up that stake, we learn to not seek change. We learn we are helpless. And then, one of those thousands of emails woke me up. It was in response to a thread of emails that was critical of me. Now, critiques of me are, are not unusual. I'm a politician, it's part of the job. What was unusual is that these critiques were from people I call friends and mentors. A woman in our community for whom I have a tremendous amount of respect responded to that thread and came to my defense. It was brave, it was kind, but most of all, it was compelling. In the piece of the email that has stuck with me since, she wrote, on climate, we all have dirt on our hands. This global challenge is too important for us to wait until we have perfectly clean hands. I read that email with a very real sense I had been rescued, rescued from learning helplessness. This is simply too important an issue for us to be frozen by our own hypocrisy or by name calling from others. The truth is the vast majority of us are hypocrites on climate. But if we all wait until our hands are perfectly clean, whether in government, oil and gas, or tourism, we may well find ourselves on the other side of a climate collapse asking why no one did anything. However powerful we could have been, we will remain helpless. My friend's simple letter pulled up that stake for me. I was free. I was free to be a part of the conversation and the response, even though my hands were dirty. Hannah Arendt was one of the most influential political philosophers of the 20th century. Dr. Arendt lived through the Holocaust. She moved around a world struggling with its own demise, and she provided deep insight into our condition as individuals and as communities. Her work on what to do when we have unclean hands speaks to me. Uh, the phrase unclean hands is, is my short form for her 1958 work called The Human Condition. In it, Arendt examines how individuals find freedom within structure or community. She suggests there are two human actions that are fundamental to living well in society, unfixing the fixed past and fixing the unfixed future, or in other words, forgiveness and work for a better future. In The Human Condition, Dr. Arendt writes, without being forgiven, released from the consequences of what we have done, our capacity to act would, as it were, be confined to one single deed from which we could never recover. We would remain its victims of those consequences forever. For Arendt, Forgiveness of ourselves and others frees us from the paralyzing consequences of our own hypocrisy. This kind of forgiveness is bigger and bolder than our modern inclination to sequester forgiveness to the realm of the individual. It's not a forgiveness for religious life, personal life, and family life. Forgiveness in Dr. Arendt's telling is corporate as much as it is individual and it has the power to move the whole of society to action. If we all acknowledge that we are culpable rather than point fingers at others, we can work together for better. That kind of action brings to mind something that my dad always said to my three brothers and I. 
He said, if not now, when? If not us, who? That quote's been running through my mind as I've prepared to speak to you today. And he said it so many times that the words feel like they're his. They are, in fact, the words of first century Jewish rabbi Hillel the Elder. Hillel is known for many things, but his founding of the Prosbul, an institution and school focused on the repair of the world, as he called it, is best known. Imagine that mandate, the repair of the world. It's almost too big to say out loud. It almost deserves our derision. But certainly, that is our climate challenge. It is the repair of the world. It is more than switching our commuting to transit or cycling. It's more than going meatless on weekdays, though it's both of those for many. It's starting to think in existential terms, to think and to act, each of us, in ways that they themselves may deserve derision. Rabbi Hillel tells us there is no time to waste. There is no time to wait. It is us and it is us now. I have a picture in my head. All of us are in a rowboat and we're way, way out at sea. We're fishing. We're enjoying the sun, we're enjoying the sea. Some at your end of the boat start to complain about their feet getting wet. I'm focused on fishing. Later, I notice you bailing. And I feel good that you've taken action on the problem you have created. You ask me for help bailing, but you seem to have it under control. And anyway, I have a fish on. Others help you bail. Some start trying to replace rotten planks. All of you at your end of the boat ask for our help. But again, it's your end of the boat, something you caused, so we keep fishing. When it finally becomes clear to all of us that the entire boat is going to sink, we get serious. We debate who's most at fault, who's least at fault. And I argue that you have no right to tell me what to do. Our boat lists, our boat tips. We yell, we yell at each other, we're angry. We tell each other how angry we are, we sink, we die. It's a sad picture I have in my head. But of course, it does not have to be this way for us. We can tell a different story. Vancouver's own Seth Klein has likened our climate emergency to the Second World War. In his book, A Good War, Seth argues our response needs to look a lot like what happened in 1937 and the years following when Canada focused on mobilizing in response to the threat of the Nazis. Like our response to COVID-19, the World War II response wasn't one industrial sector, one order of government, or one community. It was all hands, it was all people. This kind of challenge that we face asks for all of us to own it and to join in the response. If we're going to benefit from that kind of coordinated action, We are going to need to be a lot better at candor-filled and respect-filled conversations across party lines. We're going to need to acknowledge our own culpability. The oil and gas industry with all their engineering brilliance are required. The tourism sector with all their storytelling creativity are required. Governments with their convening abilities are required. You are required. I am required. We are all required. Rabbi Hillel, 
Dr. Arendt and my email writing friend are of one voice saying to all of us that we must act. I must be a part of the response, even though I have dirty hands. If I don't, if we don't, who will? If not now, when? Thank you.